In this video, I'm going to be teaching you the most difficult rules for the Lord of the Rings LCG, and this will be my final installment in this How to Play series. Now, I've had a lot of help from the community over the years in learning this game, but I wanted to give a special shout out to Trevor Davis, aka the White Tower Watchman. Uh, on his YouTube channel, he's got rules concepts videos that go way more in depth than I have time to cover in this series. And he's also going to be coming out pretty soon with a playthrough series. So I'll put a link to his channel in the description below. You should definitely check it out. Okay, and with that, let's begin. Some encounter cards reference the first player, the last player, or the next player. That is the next person sitting in clockwise order around the table. In solo games, you're always the first player, that's pretty obvious, but you're also always the last player. And in solo games, there's no next player. So cards with effects that target the next player will not trigger in solo games. If a card ability includes the word then, everything before the word then must be completely resolved or be true in order to resolve the things after the word then. Most of the time, this is going to be pretty straightforward because you're almost always going to be able to resolve the first part of the effect, like Daron's runes. You draw two cards, then discard one card. Easy. But let's take a look at Mendor from the Corset campaign. His ability says, after a quest card is defeated, ready Mendor, then each player draws one card. This means that if you don't ready Mendor, you don't get to draw the cards. This is really important, so you have to be able to fully resolve that first part in order to resolve the second part. I think this makes sense thematically, since he's a scout. It's sort of like you send him on the quest, and then he comes back with something for the group. Pretty neat. But let's contrast this with two other cards. Sam Gamgee from the Fellowship of the Ring expansion says, Response, after you engage an enemy with a higher engagement cost than your threat, ready Sam Gamgee. He gets plus one, plus one, plus one until the end of the round. Notice the absence of the word then on his card. That means he's going to get the stat boost regardless of whether he readied or not. Let's also look at Valor from the Corset campaign. It reads, response, after the attached hero is declared as an attacker, exhaust Valor to heal one damage from the attached hero and deal one damage to the defending enemy. Again, notice that there's no word then in between these two effects. So that means you get to resolve as much of the effect as you can. Even if you don't get to heal a damage, you still get to deal a damage. One last important example you'll find in the Rohan starter deck is a card called Wait No Longer. It says, at the beginning of the quest phase, search the top five cards in the encounter deck for an enemy and put it into play engaged with you. Then reveal one last encounter card this phase to a minimum of zero. So if the first part of that effect doesn't fully resolve, if you don't find an enemy in the top five cards, then you don't get to reveal one less encounter card. It's a bummer, but this card is actually amazing, so you should still use it. Some card effects will allow players or enemies to make attacks outside of the normal combat framework in the combat phase. These bonus attacks have a few features that you need to know about. Enemy attacks made outside of the combat framework do not affect the regular attacks that are made within the combat framework in the combat phase. These are separate bonus attacks, so the enemy is still going to attack you again normally. For example, if this Haradrim soldier makes an immediate attack against you in the engagement phase, he's still going to attack you again normally during the combat phase. This is actually one point where both the rules reference and the learn to play guide are wrong or maybe imprecise at best. They say that when you choose an enemy to attack in the combat phase, it needs to be an enemy that has not yet attacked this round. Reading this literally, that would mean that the Haradrim soldier would lose his regular attack in the combat phase if he does this immediate attack of his. But we know that's wrong. He's designed to attack twice in the round he engages you. So we know now that these are separate bonus attacks that don't affect their regular attacks. But apart from that difference, these attacks are handled exactly like regular attacks, meaning that you still deal the enemy a shadow card, you still follow all the normal steps for that attack, and all the same action windows open up in between each of those steps. So you can pull all those fun shenanigans that we've talked about. And now let's switch over to the player side of things. Okay, so when you use a card like Haldir or Quick Strike, 
to declare an attack, these also do not affect your normal attack opportunities during the combat phase. These are separate bonus attacks. That means you still get to declare one attack against each enemy in the combat phase. So you could use these cards to attack the same enemy multiple times in the same round if you want to. These bonus attacks will still follow all the same steps and all the same action windows open up, but it is worth noting that the way these two abilities are worded means that nobody else can join in on this attack. Only that single chosen character can attack. Some cards have effects that last until the end of the phase or until the end of the round. These lasting effects will work differently for player cards and encounter cards. Player cards only affect things in play at the time they are triggered, so they're never recalculated. Encounter cards, on the other hand, affect everything, even cards that come into play later, and so they're always recalculated constantly. Let's compare Take No Notice and Orc Hunting Party. These cards both affect the engagement cost of enemies, but they're going to work differently. Take No Notice is an action that can only be played during an action window, and it will only affect the enemies that are in play at the moment you play the action. So if an enemy comes into play later, too bad. They will not be affected by this action. However, Orc Hunting Party is going to affect all Orc enemies, even ones that have not entered play yet. So I have definitely made this mistake before of revealing a lasting effect like this and seeing it with, like if there's no enemies in play at the time, I used to just discard it and forget about it without realizing that I need to account for that for every orc enemy that comes up after that until the end of the round. Restless Evil from the Angmar Awaken cycle is another example of this. So if there's no undead enemies, it gains Surge. But then if you Surge into an undead enemy, it still gets the stat boosts until the end of the round. Now there are some encounter cards like Driven by Shadow that specify it only affects cards currently in the staging area. So this is a golden rule situation where you do exactly what this card says. You don't apply that effect to any enemies that show up afterwards. Now let's compare these lasting effects that last until the end of a phase or a round with effects that trigger at the end of a phase or a round. Let's say you use Protector of Lorien to boost your willpower and defense until the end of the quest phase. But at the end of the quest phase, the Balrog makes an attack against you. So would you still have your defense boost from Protector of Lorien to help you with that attack? Sadly, the answer is no. All until effects expire before any at effects begin. So at the end of the quest phase, the defense boost from Protector of Lorien has worn off, so you'd need to trigger Protector of Lorien again if you want more defense. The word each refers to one or more things, but never zero. For example, the Tombs of Karn Doom has a travel cost that says, Travel, deal one shadow card to each undead enemy in play to travel here. Each means one or more, so you need at least one undead enemy in play in order to travel to this location. If there are no undead enemies in play, you can't pay the cost, so you can't travel there. When you place a hero, ally, or enemy in the discard pile as the result of being destroyed, that is not the same as discarding that card. See the Horn of Gondor and Fierce Defense. Likewise, placing a location in the discard pile by exploring is not the same as discarding it. And the same goes for playing an event card. When you play an event and you place it in the discard pile after, that's not the same as discarding it. This matters when you have an ally like Galdor who triggers off of discarded cards. So none of those things we talked about count as discarding a card. Some abilities let you commit to the quest without exhausting, like Nate Guide. It's pretty cool. But that character still needs to be ready in order to commit to the quest in the first place. So if you have Berevor and you play Nath Guide to allow Berevor to commit to the quest without exhausting, if you exhaust Berevor in the planning phase to draw two cards, then you would not be able to commit her to the quest at all. Some cards will trigger when you quest successfully or unsuccessfully. But if your willpower is equal to the threat strength in the staging area, then you haven't quested successfully or unsuccessfully. So neither of these abilities would trigger. Some encounter cards target characters that are committed to the quest. So what you need to know is that characters are considered committed to the quest through the end of the quest phase. After the quest phase, 
Nobody is committed to the quest anymore, so these effects will whiff. When a card effect removes progress tokens from a quest or a quest card, that effect is specifically targeting the quest card. It's never going to affect the active location. There are several timing triggers that all happen around the end of the quest phase that at first they all kind of seem to happen about the same time, but there is a very specific order to resolve them in. And you'll find a bunch of these effects in the Rohan starter deck, so I thought it'd be helpful just to run through these real quick. Hergon, the Red Arrow, and Westfold Lancer all have abilities that trigger after questing successfully. Ancient Mathem triggers after the active location is explored. Escape from Edoras triggers after resolving a quest. And Lothiriel's ability has a portion that triggers at the end of the quest phase. So this is the order that these cards resolve in. First, you determine whether you've quested successfully or not. Then you place progress on the active location and explore it if the progress matches the quest points on that location. Then the quest is considered resolved then the quest phase ends. You may see the letter X on a card's cost or maybe on some encounter cards. These cards will always tell you what X is, but the rule is that X is always zero, unless otherwise specified. So for example, let's say I reveal Goblin Town Scavengers, which forces me to discard a card from my deck and its threat strength gets boosted by the cost of the discarded card. Well, what if the card I discarded is Stand and Fight? The cost of X isn't specified here, so it counts as zero. Lucky me. Some player cards have abilities that are limit once per game. This is a bit unintuitive, but that is actually player specific, which means if you can find a clever way to give control of that card to another player, then each player could trigger that ability once per game. Sometimes multiple abilities will share the same triggering event. So at first it looks like these things will happen at the same time, but depending on the type of ability it is, there's going to be a specific order that you need to follow. So here are the two rules. Constant abilities always happen first, then forced effects, then responses. And when effects always happen before, after effects. So let's go through a few examples here. Branching Paths has an effect that triggers at the same time as Ancient Mathem. But since Branching Paths is a forced effect and Ancient Mathem is a response, the forced effect happens first and the response effect happens after. Now here's a more complex example that you'll find in the Two Towers Saga expansion. Here we have several effects that all trigger at the same time when this Oliphant engages me. The Oliphant in the staging area says, Forced, after Oliphant engages you, exhaust each ally you control. Hero Amarthiel has a constant ability that says, While you are engaged with at least one enemy, Amarthiel gains the tactics resource icon. Hero Faramir says, Response, after you engage an enemy, ready an ally you control. And Raise the Shire is an event card in my hand that says, Response, after you engage an enemy, Search the top five cards of your deck for a Hobbit ally and put it into play. So I've got four effects that are all triggering off of the same event when this Oliphant engages me. So we're going to use this new rule that we learned to establish exactly what order we need to use to resolve these effects in. When I engage the Oliphant, here's what happens. A Marthiel immediately gains a Tactics icon from his Constant ability. Then the Oliphant's Forced ability triggers and exhausts all my allies. Then I have two responsibilities that trigger simultaneously since they're both responses. So I get to choose the order I resolve these in. I can use Amarthiel's new tactics icon to pay for Raise the Shire's responsibility, or I could use Faramir's responsibility and ready one of my allies. And lastly, here's a few examples to demonstrate that when effects trigger before after effects. Haldan triggers before Ancient Mathem. Vigilant Guard triggers before Gloin, and Scout Ahead triggers before Mendor. The order of setup matters. First, you set up your heroes and draw your starting hand. 
then you follow all the instructions on the quest card, then you start the resource phase. So let's say I'm playing Eleanor, who has a built-in ability that can cancel when revealed effects on treachery cards. This quest card tells me to reveal encounter cards during setup. So if I reveal a treachery during setup, I am allowed to use Eleanor's ability to cancel it, but I would not be able to use a test of will to cancel it because that costs one resource and I haven't gotten any resources yet at this point in the setup. Also, keywords like Surge and Doomed do trigger during setup if they are revealed during setup. Remember we said before that keywords are never triggered if they are added to the staging area. Now this rule was a bit unintuitive for me. In most card games and board games I've played, you always reshuffle the discard pile back into the deck when you're reaching to draw a card and the deck is empty. That's not how it works in this game. The rules reference says, if the encounter deck is ever empty during the quest phase, then the encounter discard pile is shuffled and reset back into the encounter deck. So first of all, this means that if the encounter deck is ever empty outside of the quest phase, you don't do anything. It just sits there empty. But during the quest phase, you'll reset the encounter deck anytime it's empty with two exceptions. Let's say there's only one encounter card left in the deck and you reveal it during staging. You wouldn't interrupt the staging of that card to reset the encounter deck. You would still finish staging the card completely first. And then immediately after staging, you'd reset the encounter deck. But if an encounter card you're staging instructs you to interact with the encounter deck in some way, like let's say it asks you to look at the top five cards or discard cards until you get an enemy, then you would first reset the encounter deck so you can finish resolving the staging of that card. Okay, let's go over a bunch of rules about shadow cards that we haven't talked about yet. When an enemy makes an additional attack or an immediate attack, you do always deal a shadow card to the enemy. It doesn't matter how or when these bonus attacks happen, they always get a shadow card. After that bonus attack resolves, you discard the shadow card right away, instead of waiting until the end of the combat phase like normal. If that bonus attack happens during the combat phase, then you would discard all of the previously dealt shadow cards first before dealing it a new shadow card for the bonus attack. So the general rule is that attacking enemies always get a shadow card, unless a card effect tells you specifically not to, or if you get lucky and the encounter deck runs out as you're dealing shadow cards during the combat phase. However, there is one really weird exception that I'm going to mention here because you'll see it in the corset campaign. There are situations where an enemy will engage you during the combat phase, but after shadow cards have already been dealt. If this happens, that enemy will still attack you normally if it engages you during the enemy attack step, but without a shadow card. This is not an additional or immediate attack, this is just a regular attack in the normal combat framework. But since it engaged you after shadow cards were dealt for the normal framework attacks, you wouldn't go backwards in the round steps and deal it a shadow card then. You just keep progressing in the round steps. It's a weird exception, but you're going to see this in the Corset campaign with Engolian Swarm, so it's good to keep in mind. It's possible for some abilities to trigger during setup, like Mablung here. His ability says response, after you engage an enemy, add one resource to Mablung's resource pool. Limit once per phase. So if an enemy engages you during setup, you'd get a resource. Cool. But here's what's weird. This ability has a limit of once per phase, but setup isn't a phase. So how do you handle abilities that trigger outside of a phase? The answer is that any per phase or per round limit is charged to the following phase or round. So Mablung's ability in setup would be treated as if it had been used in the following phase. That would be the resource phase. Aside from setup, there are situations when the encounter deck does something at the end of a phase or at the end of a round. These times are not happening in a phase. So these things take place outside of the normal round framework. Going back to this example we mentioned earlier in the video, the Balrog is attacking you at the end of the quest phase, which is outside of the normal round framework. So if you were to use Protector of Lorien's limit three times per phase ability during an action window in this attack, it would be charged to the following phase, that is the encounter phase. 
Not a big deal there, but let's look at a more important example. This enemy is from the Wastes of Eriador in the Angmar campaign. He makes an immediate attack against you when it becomes night, which is something that happens at the end of a round. If you remember, we said that immediate attacks open up all of those regular action windows, so you could trigger actions that have a limit once per round. Since all of these action windows are happening outside of the round framework, if you were to use a limit once per round ability, it would be charged to the following round. So you wouldn't be able to use it again for that entire next round. Here's another minor rule that you're not going to see a lot, but it was clarified by the designer, so it's worth mentioning. Progress is placed on the active location and the quest simultaneously. So in a situation where you have enough progress to explore both the active location and the quest card, the question has come up, which one do you resolve first? Because if you interpret the rules strictly as written, it would say that you resolve the quest first, you advance to the next stage before resolving the active location. That's how Caleb, the designer, had interpreted it in the past. And it was just super unintuitive. It caused a lot of questions. So Caleb has reversed this ruling and said that from now on, you get to resolve the active location first before resolving the quest and advancing to the next stage. That makes sense. However, since the progress is still placed simultaneously, if exploring the active location would cause you to advance to the next stage, like if the quest said you can't advance unless this particular location is explored, then any progress you had placed on the previous stage would be lost, and it wouldn't carry over to the next stage. There is no limit to the number of progress tokens on quest cards. This becomes important for quest cards like Journey Along the Anduin 1B, which have some condition that prevents you from advancing until you do something. So you can place a surplus of progress tokens to create a little bit of a buffer and protect yourself from effects that may remove progress tokens from the quest. Once an enemy or player attack is started, that attack will resolve normally even if the cards involved are moved around into different states. So like if an enemy returns to the staging area, or engages a new player, or one of your characters involved changes control to another player, None of that matters. The attack is always going to play out the same normal way as soon as it's initiated. Now here's a rule that was in the very first rulebook on page 20 that I can't find anywhere in the revised course at rulebooks. I have no idea why, because it is a needed rule. It says that hero cards in the discard pile cannot be affected by player cards unless explicitly stated on a card ability. So you can't use Will of the West to shuffle a discarded hero back into your deck so that you can like draw that hero into your hand. That can never happen. But you can definitely bring a hero back using Fortune or Fate or Houses of Healing. Let's go over some clarifications for individual cards that are commonly misplayed. Uh, these are mostly corset cards, but I'm going to throw in some cards from the revised expansions too. The timing of Faint is a little unintuitive, so let's break down what's obvious from the card itself. It's a combat action, which means it can only be played during the combat phase, so it's not going to work on attacks that happen outside of the combat phase. It is also an action, so you have to play it during an action window. But the FAQ clarifies that it can only be played in an action window before resolving step one of the target enemy's attack. So after you choose an enemy to resolve their attack, then it's too late to play faint. That also means that if an enemy makes an immediate attack against you, then you can't use faint to stop it because the attack has already begun. Very tricky. So for example, if you get the Wolf Rider shadow effect that immediately attacks you, there's no action window before the attack starts, so you can't use Faint to cancel it. But if you get White Wargs shadow effect that gives an additional attack after this one, there's still an action window before that next attack starts, so you can cancel it with Faint. Two last things about Faint. When you use Faint, you don't discard the shadow card on the enemy. It'll just get discarded with the rest of the shadow cards at the end of the combat phase. And Faint does not work against enemies that are immune to player card effects. 
Test of Will does not cancel an entire encounter card. It only cancels that particular when revealed effect part of the card. So keywords like Surge and Doom will still happen along with anything else that's not a part of the when revealed effect. These cards let you declare multiple defenders. And when you do that, all damage from the attack is assigned to only one of those defenders. For Stand and Fight, the designers have said that you can't use Stand and Fight to put neutral allies into play like Gandalf, since he doesn't belong to any sphere of influence, he's neutral. Quick Strike gives you a bonus attack that doesn't count against your normal one attack per enemy limit. It works just like a regular attack, you resolve all the regular attack steps and the same action windows open up, but no one else can join in on the attack, not even ranged characters. And surprisingly, Quick Strike does work against enemies that are immune to player card effects, unlike Faint. You can even play this during an action window in the middle of another attack. And so if you can kill that enemy with Quick Strike, then you can stop that enemy's attack altogether. The last note is that this card targets an eligible enemy. An eligible enemy is normally only an enemy that's engaged with you, but if you're using a ranged character, that could be an enemy engaged with another player. Or if you're using Dune here, it could even be an enemy that's in the staging area. Fallon's ability triggers before anything on the encounter card happens, including Surge. So Eastern Crows would be instantly defeated before their Surge kicks in, but their forced effect would still happen. Legolas's ability and Blade of Gondolin both let you put progress on the quest. Most new players play this as directly on the quest card, but that's not the case. These abilities still go through the active location, okay? Progress always goes through the active location first unless the card effect specifically says bypassing the active location. Also, whenever you complete the quest card, you immediately advance to the next quest stage, regardless of what phase you're in. So let's say, for example, that the quest card only needs one more progress token, and I'm in the combat phase. Legolas kills an enemy, and now both Legolas and Blade of Gondolin trigger simultaneously, so I can choose which one to do first. Since progress can't carry over from one quest card to another, the best thing to do here would be to first trigger Blade of Gondolin, to place that one last progress I need, then I would immediately replace the quest card, and then I can still trigger Legolas's responsibility to place two more progress tokens on the next quest card. Theodra's ability is affected by turn order. So if you are the first player and you have Theodred, you can only put his bonus resource on your own heroes. But if you're the last player, you can put his bonus resource on any of the other committed heroes. Forest Snare is another card that's pretty commonly misplayed by new players. It's an attachment that says, attach to an enemy, engage with a player. Attach enemy cannot attack. Many players will try to play this right after they engage an enemy, but this is not an event. It's an attachment. So you can't play allies and attachments outside of the planning phase normally. So typically you'll engage an enemy, take one attack from the enemy, and then you play this in the next planning phase. But there's all kinds of creative ways to get around this that are fun to discover, so I'm not going to spoil those. Also, even if an enemy is trapped in Forest Snare, you still deal the enemy a shadow card in the combat phase. You won't resolve the attack or flip the shadow card, but that shadow card is going to get discarded with the rest of the shadow cards at the end of the combat phase. Now, the two effects on Sneak Attack and Bjorn will trigger simultaneously. So remember, whenever there's simultaneous effects, you choose which to resolve first. So you can either choose to shuffle Bjorn back into your deck, or you can put him back into your hand. And if you put him back into your hand, then Bjorn's card effect that would have shuffled him back into your deck doesn't happen because he's no longer in play. When Galadrim Weaver enters play, you get to shuffle the top card of your discard pile into your deck. But there are several event cards that are commonly used to put Sylvan allies like this into play. And one of them is Host of the Galadrim. So the question often comes up about how these two cards might interact. Specifically, when exactly does a played event enter your discard pile? If you play Host and the Weaver gets put into play, does it shuffle Host into your deck or the previous card that was in your discard pile? The answer from Caleb is that Host does not 
enter your discard pile until you fully resolve its effect. That means it will float until you've put all your Sylvan allies back into play and resolve their entered play effects. And then after that, it goes in the discard pile. Hero Gandalf's ability lets you play the top card of your deck as if it was in your hand. There's a question that came up about how this works with a card like Erebor Guard, which can discard the top two cards of your deck to uh, reduce its cost. So would Erebor Guard discard himself since he's also the top card of your deck? The answer from Caleb is no, and here's why. So when you play a card from your hand, you technically place it in front of you and you pay its cost before you resolve the card. So for the instant it takes you to play a card, it's not in your hand or even in play. It is being played. So when you play Erebor Guard, you place it in front of you, pay its cost, and resolve playing the card. Therefore, it is not the top card of your deck when you play it, and it can't be discarded by its own effect. You would, however, immediately turn the top card of your deck face up as you're playing Erebor Guard with Gandalf's ability. So that would allow you to decide whether or not you want to resolve the guard's response effect after seeing the next card on the top of your deck. A Very Good Tale allows you to discard the top five cards of your deck, and Caleb has confirmed here that the cards are discarded one at a time. That matters because some cards have responses that you need to be able to trigger in between each discarded card. Hidden Cash and Arid Luin Minor will trigger immediately after being discarded. And more importantly, Dwarf Pipe lets you interrupt and put a card that was just discarded on the bottom of your deck. So what this means is that you're not allowed to look at all five discarded cards before choosing one of those to put under your deck with Dwarf Pipe. You need to decide after discarding each individual card whether you want to trigger Dwarf Pipe or not. Foe Hammer is an awesome card, but it's only triggered by a direct attack from a hero that kills an enemy. So if your attacking hero has Valor, and Valor deals the final damage to kill an enemy, that doesn't count as the hero killing the enemy. The Valor attachment killed the enemy, so it would not trigger Foe Hammer. Heir of Mardil lets you ready a hero that gains a resource. Now, gaining a resource is a blanket term that includes collecting, adding, and moving. So let's say you move a resource from one hero to another hero that has Heir of Mardil attached, using a card effect like Errand Rider. That hero is considered to have gained the resource, so you would be able to trigger Heir of Mardil. This video has been a labor of love for me that has literally taken me hundreds of hours to complete, so I'm glad it's over, but I really hope you enjoyed it. And I could not have done this alone. The community around this game is amazing. So by all means, join the Facebook group, join the subreddit, the Cardboard of the Rings Discord. They're all amazing at answering these rules questions and have done so for me for the last four years. So thank you to everyone who's ever answered my dumb questions. Um, you've been watching the Game Locker. Godspeed, everyone.